Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Island Baptist Church for the Sunday School Hour today. We're glad that you've joined us and glad that you are with us. I look forward to sharing with you from God's Word in just a few minutes. Let's go ahead and pray and ask God to bless our service this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the great gift of your Word to us. We thank you, Lord, that as we open it up today, we can be reminded of the wonder of your creation. We can be reminded, Lord, of how we are supposed to also uh, find you in your Word. And Father, we'll be reminded how we should speak to you and how we can have the joy of knowing you and being known by you. Father, we also realize that many people in the world do not know you as their Savior. They have not trusted your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior. And Father, we ask that today you would bring conviction into the hearts of those who have heard about him. Father, that you would encourage the interest and curiosity and really the the great need and desperation of those who are seeking after answers in this life, that they would turn to you and that we as Christians could share the good news of Jesus Christ to them. Father, we ask that you would stir up our hearts by what we hear in the Sunday School lesson today, and Father, that you would prepare us, Lord, to be ready to praise you and to be ready to serve you as the great Creator, but also, Lord, as our personal Savior. We pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we get into our lesson today, just want to encourage you. We had a wonderful gift to us of song by the Ladies of Island Baptist Church, and I've uploaded their video to our YouTube channel. You should be able to watch it. Uh, you perhaps already saw it if you were subscribed to our channel, but you go ahead and listen to that. It's a great ministry to us in song, and I thank the ladies for that. Also, thanks to Pastor Herbster as he wrote, but also taught that song to our church family, and it fits perfectly with the book of Philippians, which we talk about in the worship service today. That's because uh, the song is really about the book of Philippians. So you go ahead and watch that song and be blessed by that. Sing along with it. Memorize the words if you haven't already, and you can watch it before you watch the uh, worship service, and that'll be a good fit for Philippians. Well, we are not in Philippians for Sunday school. We're going to be in Psalm 19 today. Psalm 19 today. Let me say, as we're turning to this, uh, Lord willing, in the weeks ahead, Pastor Herbster is going to be sharing some lessons with us. But in the meanwhile, you pray for him as he's still recovering from COVID, and also pray for the family there as they are staying together. Just pray for their health, for their continued recovery. Of course, we would have loved to have them already back here, but we trust God's good timing in their lives. And just pray again for uh, his continued recovery, and we look forward to hearing from them all in the weeks to come. But today we are in Psalm 19, and I thought about this for two different reasons. I've had a lot of good conversations this week that, that touch on Psalm 19. It's one of my favorite uh, psalms. In the book of Psalms, it's hard to say which would be my most favorite, uh, but this is really close to the top. And in our class on Friday night, we were talking about wisdom and poetry. And one of the things that Hebrew poetry is famous for is what we've called parallelisms, that there are parallels of thought, not necessarily sound, but one idea is introduced and another will follow it. And we shared Psalm 19 as an example of that. We're going to see that in the beginning, in the opening verses. But an even deeper and maybe more substantial thing this week, I talked with two dear brothers in Christ. Uh, one of them was our church member. One was a university lecturer, also a Christian. And we were talking about how sadly there are some ways of thinking about life, philosophically, theologically, even psychologically, deep thoughts about life and reality that cut themselves off from God. There are popular writers of the past. I think of philosophers like Immanuel Kant or perhaps people like William James. Uh, now there are popular speakers like Jordan Peterson. And, and there are philosophers and psychologists and thinkers who say, maybe there's a God, maybe there's a divine, maybe there's a something out there, some, some greater purpose, some greater order, some noumenal thing out there. But you know what? We can never know. In our humanity, they say, we just don't know if there's a God. We, we should think there's a God. We should act that way, but you just can't know. And I want to tell you, friends, this is absolutely wrong. This is absolutely incorrect. You know what we also talked about in our classes this week, that the human mind, when it thinks deeply apart from God, as, as Brother Jeffrey said, leads us into despair. It leads us into depression. It leads us into hopelessness. But the great word of God, as it's been revealed to you and me, tells us wonderfully that God does speak. God does speak. There is a God who is there. There's a God who cares about us, and he has spoken to us. 
So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to share this message today was just to reaffirm the great truth that we celebrate as Christians. We worship and serve a God who speaks, a God who speaks. And we're going to see the two primary ways that we are told in the Old Testament that God speaks. There's another way that we talk about uh, in the New Testament, and I'll mention that in just a moment, but that last way is Jesus Christ. Now, as we begin with this God who speaks, we're going to see God speaks to us in his work. God speaks to us in his word. And he we then at the end speak to God in praise and in prayer. But verses one through six talk about creation. Verses seven through 11 talk about the word of God. And it remains for us to see in the New Testament that our Lord Jesus Christ is that greatest revelation of who God is. Let's look down in our Bibles and I'll read verses one through six. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the ends of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the ends of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it. And there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. You see that beautiful poetic language that the psalmist is using under the inspiration of God. The parallels there are where in verse 1 it says, The heavens declare the glory of God. There's one statement. And the echo is, And the firmament, or the skies, showeth his handiwork. This is how the psalmist was describing the work of the Lord. And here, by the way, he's focusing on the beauty of the sky. I tried to pick a picture that would show the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset. When we look at the heavens, when we look at the clouds racing by, when we look at the stars in the nighttime sky, when we look at the beauty of a sunrise or a sunset and the constant changing of the heavens over us, that is a reminder of God's creative work. Creation teaches us a lesson that there is glory and handiwork in what we see. Now, in in two ways, I want to say this. As we view the beautiful things of of life, the big word for this is aesthetically, we say it is beautiful, surpassingly beautiful. And the greatest works of art, we can say, sometimes pale in comparison to the glory and the splendor of nature. But the other thing as well is this world is is curiously and wonderfully made, just as we are. The structures and the systems and the details of the world around us is incredible. You know, one of the things that's incredible is as we've studied science more and more, it points more and more to the truth of God. Don't let people mislead you by saying that there's a false conflict. There's not. When you look at how we are situated in the universe, when you look at this world and you look at the way the universe works, it's as if, as a, as a astrophysicist once said, someone's out there who loves us very much. And when you look on the small scale, the microcosm, we might say, when you look at the cellular structure, the information of DNA, it's amazing the handiwork of God. It all points to a great creator God. I remember when I was so blessed years ago at Will Chow's baptism when he was glorifying God for his handiwork from his experience as a microbiologist. Creation declares the wonder of God. And the wonderful thing about it is this type of declaration and speech is known around the world. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. You've simply got to open up your eyes and see the world that is around you. Now, we know sadly that people all over the world turn from this awareness of God, as Romans chapter 1 says. They turn from the reality of there being one great creator, and they worship the creature rather than the creator. They make idols of of lesser gods and, and demons that they would rather worship. And friends, as a Christian, it's our great joy to go out into the world and to tell people like the Apostle Paul did that the God's that they try to worship are not the true gods, but the one God they should worship is the one who made everything, who's not worshiped with the work of man's hands, but he's a spirit who created all things. So we look at this and we say, what a great testimony that you and I have an aid in witnessing all around us in the world as we point people to the creator God who's there. And also as well, he's a God who loves us and who is good as we see in his creation. Now, not only does God speak in the world, that's where some of these philosophers and psychologists and thinkers and sadly even maybe liberal theologians would stop. 
to say, well, when we look around at the world, it seems like something's out there. When I look inside myself, it seems as if there's truth and beauty and goodness, but I just don't know. I, I'm just not sure. And that's a tragedy because we worship a God not only who created, but a God who cares enough about us to speak to us in his revealed word. Let's read these verses, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. The psalmist here obviously treasures the word of God, but you notice what the work of God does. It converts. It makes us wise. It rejoices us. It enlightens us. The word of God is what reveals the, the way we're supposed to have the fear and reverence of the Lord. The word of the God is what, is what reveals who he is and who he says we are that he is a holy, pure, and just God, and yet we are sinful. We are separated from God in our flesh naturally, and that we need to trust in his finished work of salvation so that we can be saved. You know, 2 Timothy chapter 3 says that the word of God, among all the things that it does, giving us doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction in righteousness, it also says it makes us wise unto salvation. We can know how to have our sins are forgiven, know how to have a home in heaven, know to how we can really be in an accepted position with the Lord. That's what the Word of God does. It makes us wise. It teaches us ways that we should live. We're studying this on Friday nights. The book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastic, the book of Psalms that we're in right now, the book of James, the Gospels, so many practical teachings in the Bible of how we should live. It causes us to rejoice as we see the good things in life, and we'll share that in the worship service. It causes us to rejoice as we remember our salvation in the Lord. It causes us to rejoice as we think about our home in heaven someday in so many other ways. It enlightens us. It shines a light into the darkness and the confusion of this world that we'd be so lost in. Praise God. He has given us his word. Now, that's the thing that separates us from these other groups of people who look at the world and say, well, someone's out there, something's out there, but if there's a God, we can never know him. Yes, we can, because God has given us his word. We can know him through his revealed word. And the, the fact of this ought to make you echo the psalmist and say there's great worth in the word of God. It's clean and enduring. It's true and righteous. It's more precious than gold. By the way, living in Hong Kong, I asked my students at university this week, I said, can somebody tell me what is the biggest God that's worshipped in Hong Kong? What's the most popular God? And people thought about it, and they were trying to decide, and then one of my students gave the perfect answer. You know what they said? Money. Money is the great God, and I think that's true. But you know what, Christian friends, sadly for a lot of us, it sometimes is the same way, isn't it? Is the word of God more precious to you than money? Which would you rather have if you had to have everything taken away? Now, listen, the Bible is quite honest. The Bible says money is very useful. Money is something we should be a steward of and use it to serve God and even to, to help bring people to Christ. But how do you value it in comparison to the Word of God? The Word of God sweeter than honey, and there's great reward in keeping this Word of God. So again, if we realize that we were in this world, mysterious and wonderful an incredible world, and we look around and wonder, is there more to life than this? Is there really a God? And now we have the great God who has revealed his word to us. We ought to treasure it and say there's great worth in the word of God. Praise the Lord that he gave it to us. Now, we'll say this as well, although it's not in Psalm 19. We see the creation around us that reveals God. We have the word of God in our hand. But the greatest thing that happened to us is that the Lord Jesus Christ also came to reveal God. So the question of our friends and maybe family members who say, can I really know God? Is God the kind of thing or person I could know? Yes. Not only yes from creation, yes from the word of God, but yes, the person of God came 
to live on earth. John chapter 1, when it says, you know what? The, the law came by Moses. This was just praised in Psalm 19. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Far much more valuable to us than gold and than anything else we could have here on earth. Now, as this psalm closes out, I love that it closes out personally. Look it down in your Bibles at verses 12 through 14. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I love that the reaction in Psalm 19 by the psalmist is to say, when I look at the work of God and his handiwork, when I look at the beauty of his law, I say to myself, God, I need your help. I cry out to God and I ask for cleansing. I can't understand my own self, both in the goods and the bads. There are mysteries upon mysteries within us. Uh, there's a poem, uh, I think Robert Frost, who had said, you know, they, they cannot scare us with their open spaces, those places where no human race is. He was talking about outer space. And somebody tells you how many trillions and billions of stars and planets and galaxies there are. And he says, I'm not scared by that. What mystifies and stupefies me is the mystery within my own heart and my mind. And when I look at myself, I often pray to God, Lord, forgive me for this, what I've done, but forgive me for those things that I should have done or that I, I don't know of, those things that have separated me from you in relationship, Lord. Cleanse me from secret sins. We ask God for cleansing and praise the Lord for Christians. He is faithful and just to forgive us for all these things. And we don't have to worry about our relationship being lost, but we do want to make sure our relationship is not affected by sinful hearts and sinful hands. We ask not only for cleansing, but we ask to be kept by God. Keep me from presumptuous sins and from great transgressions. The psalmist would pray this. We think about great transgressions. You know, all sins are sinful. All sins are condemning us in the eyes of God before we're forgiven by Jesus Christ. But you know what? We also recognize there are some things that we would say are great transgressions, not just because it's a, somehow a more weighty sin, but because it causes greater damage to ourselves and those around us, right? Now, it's, it's silly when people talk a little white lie and then a, a big lie. They're both lies. But, you know, sometimes there are sins we can say that wreck and ruin people's lives. And whether they be big sins or little sins, pray to God and say, Lord, keep me from sin. Even the Lord Jesus Christ, he advised us to pray in this way. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We pray to be kept. And notice the psalmist here. He, he doesn't even think to pray this way. Lord, keep me in perfect health, although there are prayers for health all through the Bible. But he says, Lord, the most important thing is my heart and my soul with you. So keep me from transgression. When you look at God, remember this, when you look at God and you see him for who he is and what he's done, the reaction is humility and abasement. Uh, the word abasement means we, we, we lower ourselves and we humble ourselves before God and we say, Lord, I am unworthy to stand before you. Cleanse me and keep me from disappointing and sinning against you. By the way, this is the real reason why people don't want to know if there's a God. This is the real reason why people are content to look at nature and say, well, maybe there's a God, but we just can't know him. Because we find out from the word of God that what the word of God reveals and the Lord Jesus Christ revealed as well, and what we even knew in our consciousness, at, at consciences at a small level, is that we are guilty before God. That's why we have to ask for cleansing and for keeping. And that's also why, praise the Lord, Jesus Christ is so precious to us because he has cleansed us and he will keep us safe. That's how we speak to God in humility. After all, we look and see what he is or what he's done and who he is. Lastly, this is actually one of my favorite verses in the Psalms. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I was a late starter and really memorizing a lot of Bible verses. And this was the first one that I started with, a constant prayer that's constantly on my lips. I pray and I hope you will pray that God will let the words of my mouth. God has spoken, hasn't he? He's spoken in creation. He's spoken in the word of God, the law, the Old Testament, the New Testament. But may my words 
and the things that I think about in my heart, may those be acceptable in the eyes of God. He is our Lord, He's our strength, and He's our Redeemer. Friends, I want to challenge you. If you never memorize this, take this memory verse and dedicate it to your heart. We saw the great God who speaks to us, and now you need to speak to God and ask Him to help you. Praise the Lord. He can be found. He can be known. You have been given a precious gift. You've been given the Bible. You've been given the hope of heaven in your hearts if you're a Christian. God has spoken, and now he wants you to not only speak to him, but speak on his behalf and share the good news with others. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you so much for your word today that reminds us that you have spoken to us, not only in creation, which everyone can see, but also in your word, which everyone needs to hear, and ultimately in your son, Jesus Christ, which everyone needs to be saved by. Father, right now, as the psalmist did, we just bow and humble, humble ourselves before you because we know that you are great. We know you're glorious and high and lifted up. And Father, we are sinful and needy people. And so, Father, we do ask that you would cleanse us from our sins, that you would restore the right relationship we need to have with you, and keep us, Lord, from future sins, from presumptuous sins. Keep us from ruining our lives and the lives of others by our fleshly and sinful deeds. And, Father, we pray as we just read, Lord, these verses, and we ask that you would help us to hide them in our hearts. We ask that you would help the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart be acceptable, Lord, in your sight. You're our Lord, you're our strength, and you're our Redeemer. Thank you for redeeming us, Father, and help us in all these ways. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.